Welcome, everybody, uh, for the session talk, uh, second talk on the evaluating OpenStack session. Uh, so we have a trio of people from Ericsson who will talk uh, about uh, evaluating OpenStack yourself versus waiting for the help from the foundation or from the third parties to do it. So you will evaluate it exactly on the features and uh, uh, technology which you wanted, not what somebody else does it for you. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the last session of the first day at uh, OpenStack Summit. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, various uh, cloud options and uh, uh, some uh, quick steps to evaluate those options for enterprises which are ready to take the, uh, implement their uh, cloud strategy into action. Uh, let me start with the introduction of the team here. Um, we are from Ericsson uh, Cloud Solutions team, and uh, would like to introduce uh, the speakers here. Myself, uh, Niketu Parekh, I'm a Cloud Solution Architect. With me, I have uh, Sudhi Batra and uh, uh, Ronnie Haddad. We are all part of the same uh, Cloud Solution in, in, uh, team at Ericsson. And uh, in today's uh, topic, uh, the things we will be discussing are primarily uh, looking at uh, the situation that uh, every single enterprise is going to face. Either they have already addressed this uh, situation, uh, or they are ready to uh, look into the next uh, logical step of evaluating the cloud options. Then uh, we'll look at uh, various approaches. And uh, as part of the approach, uh, we'll touch upon step-by-step uh, uh, -step process of uh, uh, evaluating various options. Uh, we have tried to uh, broadly uh, capture them as uh, three different phases. First one is to uh, know the options available. Second one is uh, talk about uh, the evaluation framework itself. And then last uh, step is uh, basically the decision making and uh, uh, planning exercise. And we'll conclude with the summary. So with that, I would like to hand over to Ronnie to kick off the discussion. Ronnie. Okay. Thank you, Niketu. So, as Niketu just mentioned, uh, this is today's uh, problem for large enterprises. So the enterprise, you know, is realizing that we're trying to make the shift, the digital transformation or the cloud transformation, and adopt some kind of you know cloud strategy. So. Uh, uh, you know, we're starting with this uh, funny Dilbert cartoon. Employees got the directive that, you know, they need to do something. They need to fix the large enterprise problem and adopt cloud somehow. And um, they're just discussing, you know, cloud computing, how to adopt it, how do we go about it. And they really have no idea what to do. Uh, in fact, I mean, today I was actually surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised. There's a lot of, you know, first timers here at the summit. And, you know, this indicates that the adoption is still ongoing. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of enterprises that are still trying to make the move to uh, cloud. So, uh, you know, how do we go about this? Or what is the current problem? So a given enterprise has you know, several departments, and all these departments have different business drivers and different goals, like a finance department or a marketing department, IT operations, you know, different businesses, uh, R&D, security, et cetera. Uh, everyone wants to achieve some sort of agility, some sort of uh, quick time to market. Uh, you know, proximity towards end users, faster, quicker services, quicker delivery, flexibility, uh, you know, faster deployment of production or uh, lab test environments, etc. right? Adopting or, con you know, conforming to regulatory uh, requirements. So how do they go about this in which cloud to adopt, right? That's the, the big question. Uh, so, what we've done is we've come up with an approach to try to do that as, uh, you know, as, a, as an exercise within the enterprise. So we have a five-step approach. The uh, first step or the first two steps are really to know your options. 
So what are the options uh, out there? What is the deployment model? We'll talk more about the deployment model in a little bit. What is the service model? You know, do we want to adopt, for a deployment model, do we want to adopt a private, public cloud, hybrid, you know, community? Today we even heard about another one, right? Private cloud uh, as a service. So what are the options out there? Uh, we'll you know, know some details about all these options. And the different components. So even if you adopt the you know, specific service model, uh, then what components do you need to worry about? Then after we, if, you know, we look at all the options available, we try to come up with an evaluation framework. So we look at the different apps, the different businesses, their requirements from several dimensions, you know, technical, architectural, business requirement, et cetera. Then uh, once we you know, look at these requirements, then we look at you know, the, the cost. So we have a cost analysis that needs to happen. And you know, once we narrow down the options based on these requirements, as well as some sort of financial analysis, uh, we try to make some decisions uh, and you know, come up with a migration uh, strategy in order to make that move to the cloud. So we talked about knowing your options. What are the different options? What are the different cloud deployment models? Something you know, most of you know, we have public clouds. In fact, you know, we heard today there's over 50 uh, public clouds running on OpenStack around the world. And you can you know, go to the OpenStack marketplace and, and look at these. And there's obviously AWS, there's Google Cloud, uh, Rackspace, uh, other you know, public clouds that we all know about. Uh, and, and on the other hand, there's the private clouds. And enterprises are trying to deploy their uh, private clouds. Some of them are struggling. And, you know, and we've heard some of them are you know, starting with private clouds, running it for several years, then switching. And we've heard also the other case where you know, people have gone to the uh, public cloud and then decided, okay, well, I've got so many problems doing this, then let me switch to try to do this uh, with a different model, either you know, hosted, managed service, on-premise, et cetera. Uh, and then there's you know, obviously the hybrid cloud case where uh, you know, we want to start with uh, public or private. And let's say we start with a pri private cloud and we want to you know, be able to uh, be a little bit more flexible and extend to private cloud so we connect to you know, one or, or more uh, public clouds uh, from our uh, private clouds. Uh, so these are our cloud deployment models. Then the service models are also something uh, you guys, maybe most of you are familiar with, but let's refresh your memory a little bit here. So we have uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. So infrastructure as a service, obviously we provide infrastructure uh, as a service to the users. Platform as a service where uh, I guess the users have to worry less about one part of the stack. Uh, and so you know, we can provide the underlying OS and, and middleware and runtime, and then have the users only worry about their applications uh, and data, so deploying their applications and worrying about their data. And you know, lastly, your software as a service, where the whole stack is provided to the users, and the users have to uh, basically use their uh, applications. So, so we talked about you know, the deployment models, the different service models, and whichever one you adopt, right, there's a set of components that you kind of need to consider when you're trying to make the move to the cloud. So what are these essential components? So it's a, it's a big dinosaur, obviously, and uh, you know, the, the different parts of it are the infrastructure we just talked about. So IAS, where you have your compute, storage, and networking, and then the next level, which is platform as a service, BAS, right? Where we provide the, the platform for the developers uh, to deploy their applications. And then, you know, one thing we all need to do is ops and management, right? One way or the other, we have to manage either the infrastructure or the platform or sometimes the applications running around it. And of course, the layer that, you know, sometimes we ignore, but we cannot, which is security. So security is an important part 
uh, of this where we have to consider security at all levels, whether it's you know, physical, network, infrastructure, uh, et cetera. So I'm gonna hand over to uh, my colleague, Sudeep here, who's gonna go in a little bit more detail about the different uh, you know, options when it comes to infrastructure and uh, pass and tools for uh, ops and management. Thank you, Bernie. All right, so, uh, so I'll, I'll throw more light on the uh, infrastructure components that are involved that we need to decide upon. So uh, the first criteria, of course, is to uh, decide the Linux distribution and the three major Linux distribution that we have is the Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, and CentOS. And then there are various vendors uh, who are providing these OpenStack distributions. So uh, uh, that also needs to be decided. Now, when we look at this infrastructure component from the IAS, we have like three broad categories, uh, which we know, network, compute, and storage. So we need to decide on those factors. So when we look at network, then there is an the aspect of network segmentation, which is like deciding what type of uh, network, like private network or the tenant network, the provider network or the storage network. So those aspects needs to be decided. And then is of course the SDN software defined networking, which needs to be decided depending on your workload, characteristics, uh, service chaining requirement or uh, SRIV requirement for your workloads. So that needs to be decided. And then the underlay, which is really the uh, the switching fabric, the leaf spine architecture, as well as the connectivity to the gateway router. So those aspects need to be planned out. And then we have to look at the compute uh, aspects like selection of the hypervisor. If there is already a hypervisor being used in the organization like VMware, maybe you would need to select that. Otherwise, KVM is the default choice that uh, mostly it has been used. Now, uh, the next aspect in the compute is the selection of the hardware. And uh, for the selection of the hardware, uh, you have to really look at the various uh, aspect of uh, uh, overcommit ratio or the instance size uh, for the uh, hypervisor. And then the workload requirements are really uh, depending on your application requirement. If there is specific application requirement, uh, that needs to be taken care of. So that also need to be considered. And then we look at the storage, uh, planning out for the ephemeral storage, which is for the VM onboarding. The VM needs to be done, so that needs to be planned out. And the block storage uh, and the object storage for the files uh, and stores. Oops, again. Oh. All right, uh, okay. So this is, uh, again, in case the uh, decision is toward the public cloud, then also you, you have to select on the various components on the network compute storage. So, uh, and again, there are various factors that need to be uh, considered. Now, the other big area is really the operations and management components. And here again, uh, the two broad categories is the deployment orchestration configuration management, this aspect, and the logging, monitoring, and alerting. So deployment is the selection of the tool, and we have uh, various tools like Fuel, Triple O, which uh, will help in doing the production deployment. Uh, of course, for the learning, we had been using Packstack or uh, DevStack uh, deployment tools. Uh, but that selection needs to be considered when the deployment uh, for production workload has to be planned out, production OpenStack deployment. And then there is a selection of the orchestration uh, platform. 
And there are various orchestration platform. Ericsson has an orchestration platform like Ericsson Cloud Manager, which can be used for deploying the various uh, virtual applications. Irrespective of whichever underlying OpenStack platform you have, it can be used to deploy your virtual applications. And also there is uh, uh, another own app uh, that is open network automation platform based on open e-comp, which can be used and it's really to address the telecom network orchestration. And the underlying, these tools will of course talk to the Heat API to be able to orchestrate the VM uh, onboardings. And we have the configuration management for our platform, which can be done using various tools like Puppet, Foreman, or also uh, other tools like Ansible or Chef can be used for doing that. Uh, then the important aspect is the logging, monitoring. Monitoring, we are considering operational monitoring, but there is also a tenant monitoring, which needs to be planned out. And then uh, for, for this, the initial step will be to identify the metrics that you want to monitor for your environment and the services, the OpenStack services or the uh, underlying operating system services that you want to monitor. So those aspects needs to be decided. And uh, thereafter, there is a need to plan out the various tools like logging, monitoring, alerting. Uh, typically, uh, there's a tool like Stacklight by Mirantis, which can be planned out. And uh, if you already have an existing tool like Nagios, then uh, there is a need to decide on the integration between that Nagios tool. And of course, we have the OpenStack telemetry, Silometer, which can be used uh, for doing. OK, the next big aspect is the security. Now, security is really a very big factor, and uh, it really needs to have a, uh, a consulting to decide on how we can uh, do a security for the entire uh, organization uh, and uh, apply to the OpenStack distribution. Now, here, what we are looking at is really uh, what are the security concerns that is there for an organization. So broadly, there are six categories, cloud infrastructure, cloud security controls, multi-tenancy, cloud management, hypervisor, and data protection. So the security concerns can come from the various areas, right? And in order to uh, ensure that all these security concerns are addressed, we have to really apply uh, a proper mechanism. So here we are presenting like a six stage uh, mechanism. Uh, so each of these needs to be applied and uh, there are various uh, aspects like when you talk about compliance and gap assessment, so there's a need to apply some uh, security standards, certification, and then uh, when it's the risk assessment, you have to really look at that multi-tenant, those aspects. And security assessment and auditing for the hypervisor and applying various uh, security mechanism like uh, 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 you know, uh, SE Linux or VRMOD, those kind of security aspects. So each of these need to be looked at in detail when planning out the security. Uh, when we come to pass, really these are the uh, driving factors and the deciding factors which leave, uh, lead to uh, the selection of a pass. And uh, the components uh, are, these are the components which really need to be looked at uh, when deciding the pass components. So with that, I will hand over to my colleague Nikitu to talk about the next stage of evaluation framework. Okay, so now that we have looked at all the options available for evaluation purpose, Next uh, logical step is basically to look into the evaluation framework. And uh, looking at the evaluation framework that you can see in the slide, the approach that we have adopted is uh, basically to come up with a very simple uh, framework that is uh, modular enough that it can be easily applied to any uh, situation. And uh, along with that, it needs to be generic enough so that it can be applied to any kind of uh, uh, deployment model 
whether it is public versus private cloud or a hybrid cloud option being uh, evaluated, as well as uh, uh, any type of uh, service model or consumption model. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the framework remains uh, consistent across uh, all the applicable scenarios. Right? So along with that, um, in terms of uh, applicability and uh, overall framework components, what we have uh, is basically starting with the step-by-step -step process. And the first step is basically looking at the re application requirement analysis, where uh, uh, major input is uh, based on uh, various uh, applications uh, requirements. So as an output of that uh, first step is basically looking at various uh, feasibility uh, options, uh, meaning that when you perform the, the requirement analysis, the outcome of that analysis is that uh, you have a shortlisted uh, uh, options in terms of what uh, cloud uh, options need to be further evaluated uh, uh, down the road. Uh, and uh, along with that, you come up with a list of uh, features which are uh, mandatory in terms of uh, fulfilling your cloud uh, uh, strategy. And uh, the next logical step uh, is basically to uh, dimension the whole uh, cloud solution. That includes uh, infrastructure dimensioning as well as uh, uh, various features uh, which requires a specific dimensioning uh, based on uh, the situation. So as output of the cloud dimensioning is uh, basically your overall cloud size. And uh, I guess everybody will be familiar with uh, uh, what the cloud size is. Uh, if you refer to the latest uh, uh, OpenStack survey report, you can see that there is a whole dedicated section about uh, the cloud size, which, which consists of uh, uh, various uh, uh, line items that uh, needs to be evaluated individually. So we'll look into that uh, later on further uh, when we dis look, uh, discuss the framework. And then once we have the cloud size uh, identified, uh, the next uh, step is basically to uh, look into the total cost of ownership or uh, return of uh, investment uh, analysis. So there are two different inputs. One of them is the cloud size, and the second input to this uh, particular step is uh, all the cost factors. As you can imagine, for any kind of cost analysis, there are various different aspects that uh, influence the overall uh, cost analysis. So we'll look into that uh, further down the road. So this is uh, basically the overall structure of the framework. Uh, now let's look at uh, uh, individual components. So let's start with uh, the requirements analysis phase. And uh, the requirement analysis phase is basically a multi-dimensional uh, analysis. And uh, the typical uh, structure you can see here is that uh, for any given uh, enterprise environment, uh, they must be following some kind of uh, requirement analysis uh, uh, process or a model. And uh, if we have to basically uh, categorize various requirements uh, independent of uh, what application it is or uh, what organization it belongs to, you can categorize those uh, requirements into these uh, six broad categories, functional, non-functional, architectural, uh, O&M related requirements, security re related requirements, and uh, performance and uh, workload profile related requirements. Right? And uh, when we are doing the analysis, we are not talking about uh, uh, reinventing the wheel here. We are trying to follow the same methodologies that are uh, uh, being followed for uh, uh, requirement anal analysis phase at an enterprises. But uh, instead, uh, what we are looking at is various uh, business drivers. So we are requir uh, requirement are being evaluated against various business drivers. Some requirements may be positively or negatively impacting uh, one business drivers, whereas it is completely independent uh, or not applicable for uh, uh, other business drivers. So the heat map that we have uh, shown here represents uh, the same thing. Uh, in, in reality, the framework itself has a positive or negative or uh, not applicable uh, as a scoring mechanism uh, against uh, these requirements that can help evaluate the requirements against the uh, business drivers for adopting the cloud uh, strategy. And again, it's an, uh, another dimension to that we can apply this uh, uh, we can evaluate those requirements against uh, various deployment models as well as uh, various uh, service models. So let's look at an example. 
Here we are looking at a few sample examples uh, that Enterprise uh, has readily available, meaning that uh, these apl applications are uh, cloud ready, means architecture wise and um, all aspects, they are uh, uh, completely suitable for uh, migration to cloud. Right? So then when we do the requirement analysis of these applications, cloud ready applications, we can come up with uh, a consolidated superset of requirements that basically will needs to be fulfilled in order to migrate those uh, applications successfully to the cloud. So when we have this superset readily available, what we can use uh, look at it is uh, which application uh, which uh, application requirements are not being fulfilled uh, by a specific uh, cloud option, and that helps us to apply the process of elimination and uh, reduce our uh, uh, options, uh, which needs further evaluation. Uh, so looking at the second phase of the framework, which is cloud dimensioning. And here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the main categories of uh, the cloud dimensioning that we are considering here are uh, looking at the, uh, what is the size of your cloud in terms of number of computes. Uh, you need to know uh, that uh, primarily it's going to be a uh, homogeneous uh, uh, infrastructure that you are going to deploy, meaning that you need to know the processors and number of cores, et cetera, needed for the compute nodes. You need to know the infrastructure needs for the whole networking aspect. Uh, and you also need to know uh, what type of uh, instances that you are going to need, as well as uh, how many of those instances. You need to know the whole uh, size of the network that needs to be deployed uh, as underlay as well as uh, overlay to handle the application related uh, networking needs. And uh, along with that, the storage aspect also needs uh, a more detailed uh, evaluation from dimensioning perspective. So what we have done here in this particular case, uh, we are just trying to demonstrate that uh, out of all these uh, separate, uh, different uh, uh, items that are for applicable for uh, cloud dimensioning. Some of them apply to uh, public cloud and some of them apply to um, private cloud. So we need to very uh, uh, clearly identify uh, which uh, of this uh, dimensioning aspect is applicable for what deployment model. Okay. Moving on to the next, uh, as an example, what we have tried to demonstrate here is that uh, out of those uh, requirement analysis phase where uh, we looked at uh, the whole bunch of requirements, uh, uh, specifically talking about uh, the performance characteristics of uh, individual application. That application um, performance characteristics are primarily related to uh, either the capacity needs of uh, the application or performance specific uh, needs of that application. And on top of that, uh, there could be virtualization related uh, uh, requirements uh, that needs to be uh, appropriately uh, analyzed and applied to the cloud dimensioning model. And again here, the, uh, the model that we are looking at is uh, kind of uh, generic enough so that uh, uh, it can be applied to every single application that is being uh, evaluated and uh, dimensioned for uh, cloud migration. And the resource uh, requirement summarization tool that we are looking at it is basically trying to summarize uh, the overall requirement of uh, all the applications which are ready for being migrated over to cloud. And at the end, you, what you have is basically a bill of material that uh, consists of uh, what type of hosts are needed, how many of them are needed, what kind of uh, flavors we need, how many of those flavors are needed, what uh, storage requirements are, uh, as well as uh, networking requirements, et cetera. Moving on to the next uh, phase, which is primarily the cost of ownership and uh, uh, return on investment analysis. Again, um, as mentioned earlier, there are many different aspects and uh, factors that influence uh, the cost of ownership. Uh, we have given a, a sample of those uh, uh, factors, uh, such as uh, hardware and infrastructure. Uh, primarily that applies only to the private cloud deployment scenario because when it comes to public cloud, uh, you are not deploying any uh, cloud on your own. You have everything readily available uh, from the, any public uh, cloud service provider. In terms of software licensing as well, uh, more than likely it is applicable for the private uh, uh, cloud deployment. 
uh, unless there is a, a specific scenario where uh, uh, the application virtual machines also need to uh, carry along the license uh, uh, over to the public cloud deployment. Along with that, uh, other uh, considerations are uh, LCM and operations aspects, uh, both from the infrastructure perspective as well as for uh, applications perspective that needs uh, proper uh, uh, cost analysis. And one big uh, uh, factor is the data center cost. And here we are talking about uh, every single data center that uh, uh, needs, uh, that basically uh, is part of the cloud uh, strategy and uh, applications are being migrated over to various uh, data centers. And uh, costs such as uh, uh, renting, the, uh, renting the data center premise as well as uh, uh, all the operational aspects of uh, uh, powering it and uh, HVAC and uh, many other aspects. So again, uh, the whole data center cost aspect is uh, applicable only for the private cloud scenario, whereas uh, for public, we don't need to worry about that. And another big uh, uh, piece is uh, the pay uh, per use uh, case, where uh, uh, in the case of private cloud deployment, uh, it is primarily not uh, uh, applicable. Whereas in case of public cloud, uh, uh, the whole uh, fundamental uh, pricing of a public cloud is based on a pay per use model, which means that uh, uh, that has very heavy influence on your overall uh, uh, cost analysis uh, for uh, uh, for your uh, assessment. And last but not least, uh, it's a training and uh, competence building, which is applicable for both uh, public and private cloud. Right, so let's take a quick look at uh, uh, how we are trying to address the uh, uh, total cost of ownership and uh, return on investment analysis. So here, uh, what we have uh, shown here in this graph is basically, uh, we have picked only the material cost of uh, uh, the virtual machines uh, in case of uh, public cloud or the equivalent of uh, number of computes that we need to deploy to match the same amount of uh, uh, virtualized uh, resource requirements, right? So what you can see here is that uh, we are looking at a, a specific uh, uh, configuration set of the virtual uh, virtualized resource requirement, which is basically total 160 virtual machines uh, on uh, different uh, public cloud options, and then comparing the same towards uh, private cloud, where we are looking at uh, how many number of servers are needed uh, to provide the same number of uh, virtual machines. So based on this uh, uh, specific uh, line item uh, as one of the factors of uh, overall cost analysis, what we have tried to show in, in this uh, graph is that uh, uh, the cost of ownership uh, basically between uh, uh, private cloud, which is the blue line, versus uh, all the other uh, public cloud options. And uh, as you apply other uh, uh, cost uh, uh, factors into the equation, you will see that uh, the graph or the difference between uh, the private cloud and uh, public cloud uh, uh, changes. So that's the whole uh, cost, uh, total cost of ownership uh, analysis that uh, uh, the tool is uh, able to accommodate. Moving forward, uh, beyond the framework, uh, then once we have the outcome of the evaluation framework, which could be one or maybe maximum of uh, two cloud options, we need to go through the rest of the, uh, uh, rest of the process of uh, the planning various uh, activities beyond selection. So beyond selection, what we are looking at is uh, we need to uh, make uh, sure that uh, we are going through the whole uh, formal uh, proof of concept uh, activity so that uh, the team who are actually gonna work on the de deployment uh, or cloud adoption, they are well familiar with uh, the, uh, the cloud architecture and uh, uh, the cloud solution being uh, adopted. Along with that, another uh, critical uh, uh, planning activity is uh, to uh, carry out the whole performance uh, testing activity. And last but not, le not the least is uh, basically establishing uh, overall uh, cloud adoption uh, timeline. So let's look at uh, the proof of concept. So the main purpose uh, we need to conduct the proof of concept is 
to uh, help uh, understand the architecture of the cloud solution being adopted and understand the nitty gritty details of uh, how uh, pricing is gonna work if it's a private cloud or uh, if it's a public cloud or uh, various other considerations. Also along with architecture, operational aspects and uh, uh, hands-on experience uh, is vital for team to build the competence needed as well as uh, feasibility of uh, various automation aspects. So these are very typical uh, uh, items that uh, we, can, we carry out during the uh, uh, proof of concept activity so that uh, we are kind of uh, taking the first necessary step uh, to come up with a high level design uh, for the solution and also identify various uh, deployment tools that we are gonna need as well as uh, uh, some high level uh, deployment guideline that can uh, help us uh, uh, with a more uh, robust uh, solution for deployment. So that was about the proof of concept. Uh, let's look at uh, performance characteristics. Again, uh, performance characteristics testing is uh, vital and crucial. Uh, it's not an optional activity because of the fact that uh, performance your application is uh, basically going to dictate whether uh, your cloud strategy will be successful or not. Because, I mean, uh, we have witnessed uh, so many uh, cases where uh, the deployment uh, was successful, but uh, the, uh, it was not able to fulfill the performance uh, needs of various applications. So then it's a uh, complete uh, different exercise of uh, tuning your perf uh, application performances and uh, whole nine yards related to that aspect. So before we uh, take the final step of migrating uh, applications, uh, performance testing is a must step. Moving on to next uh, last item in this uh, section, which is about uh, the cloud adoption timeline. And here again, uh, uh, various uh, factors influence uh, timeline. Just like we saw in previously, the cost uh, analysis also had various uh, factors that can positively or negatively influence uh, the and the total cost of ownership. So, uh, some of those uh, uh, factors also influence uh, the overall timeline of uh, your project timeline of your, uh, your cloud adoption strategy. I won't go through the whole list here, but uh, one important uh, uh, factor that is mentioned here is about the migration. And uh, Ericsson has a tool that uh, helps uh, plan out the entire migration. And I'd like to, uh, invite Ronnie to uh, talk about the migration tool. Okay, so I know we're running almost out of time here, so we'll go just real quickly through this. Um, basically, we've gone over the options, uh, and you know we presented the framework in order to evaluate which options to go with. And essentially, once you figure that out, you narrow it down one or two options, you need to kind of walk the walk. And, there are several tools to do that. So one of them is this Ericsson Transmigration Engine, which is a tool that would help you, uh, you know, collect all of your enterprise applications and put together a schedule and a timeline in order to basically walk the walk, like we said. And uh, this is just various uh, screenshots from the tool where you, you know, list your apps, uh, list uh, different characteristics of each app, and. Um, you know, kind of put together a timeline in order to execute this uh, migration to your favorite cloud option. So really in summary here, what we need to know is we look at the business requirement first. And you know, it's needed to make the shift to the cloud. So we got to know our options, evaluate our options, look at our TCO, and at the end, we need to do some sort of, you know, proof of concept and benchmarking and then basically I do the migration, go through the migration process. So thank you very much, and we'll, we'll take any questions.